All right, so we are, we are wrapping up the series that we've been doing on prayer. And I hope that you guys have been blessed. I've, I've really experienced the love of our Father and, and how He told us to pray really shows the heart of God towards us in, in that He is looking to bless us. He's looking to be a loving Father uh, to us. He's not a distant, uh, cold God where we have to offer up these, these try to earn his, his pleasure the way that false gods work. But he is a loving father that wants to be involved in our life on a daily basis and to reach out to him on a daily basis and have interaction with us. And so I've been blessed in looking at this, this prayer and, um, and, and it just reveals the heart of the father for his kids. Uh, I'm going to read that right now. We're going to start in verse 7 in Matthew 6, verse 7. It says, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. And, and here's the cool thing. God hears you, right? It's one of the first things we talked about is, is we don't have to repeat things over and over again. He's right here with us, and God hears us when we pray. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. So we're going to look at that last part of that, that prayer this morning. It says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us uh, from evil. And it's, it's, um, it's kind of funny the way that it, it, the translation works out here. Uh, because it's it, it sort of like, do you guys expect God to lead you into temptation? Like, is that your expectation of it? kind of comes across as sort of funny to us because... It's, not, it's my understanding of God. The Word says that, that He doesn't tempt anybody. God doesn't tempt, right? And, and the, what's going on here is that, that translation of that word that's used for temptation here can mean a couple of different things. It's the same word, but depending on the context of where it's at, it it's, can either be a positive thing or it can be a negative thing. So it has two different meanings depending on the context. So it can either mean temptation meaning that I'm going to try to entice you to do evil, that kind of temptation, or it can mean testing, meaning that the refiner's fire, right? Like, like the testing in our lives that reveals and brings the dross to the surface in our lives so that God can scrape it off of our lives. So it can mean both of those things. And in this case, it's talking about those testings in our life. Lead us not into testing, but deliver us from evil. And the word evil here means suffering that comes from evil. And <clears throat> evil is kind of a funny word for us because of our comic books and movies, right? And we think of evil, we think of the boss, you know, evil, you know, is this idea of, of something that is extraordinarily bad, but evil is really just human nature. We think of ghosts and goblins and, and really evil guys with twisty mustaches, right? <clears throat> but evil is when you're doing things contrary to the will of God. Is the nature in us. The Bible says there's no one good. So that kind of puts paid in, in Romans chapter 3. It says there's no one good, not one. There's no one who seeks God. There's no one. It talks about our, we rush to shed blood. We all have the capacity for that evil in our lives. That's human nature coming out in us. You don't have to look very far to find evil, do you? Evil is everything that comes from our selfish living or human nature. <clears throat> we were just talking about, uh, Dan and I were just talking about 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, and I think it's, I've heard it from Dan a few times over the last several weeks. I think it's a verse that's been sitting with him a lot. It says, do not love the world 
or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of the Father lives forever. So that's this, it's such a great scripture because it really encapsulates our human nature and that ugliness that comes up inside of us. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. How often does that rear its head in our life? In, in our materialism, in us needing the latest iPhone. I just have to have it, right? Or the things that we see and that we want, or the things that we take in through our eyes that we shouldn't. Or the pride that prevents us from having right relationship with people. How many relationships can you think of in your life that are broken, that wouldn't be broken if you had humility? Right? That's hard, isn't it? And a lot of us are sitting here thinking, at least on the side, going, well, they wouldn't be breaking it broken if the other person had humility either. <laughs> right? It'll pop up a little bit, right? That's the pride of life in our hearts. Is how many of those relationships could be healed and, and be right if we wouldn't be able to set aside that pride. And that's it's interesting because that's what sin means. It means broken relationship. Pride destroys right relationship. So when we're tested in our lives, it always leads to choice. Lead us not into testing. Lead us not into temptation or testing, but deliver us from evil. And the choice is, are we going to serve Jesus? Are we His? Do we love Him? Or do we choose evil? Do we choose to serve ourselves? Do we choose our own way and our own want? This talk about being tested, it's, it's, it's Lord, lead me not into testing, but if I'm going to be tested, keep my heart right. Don't let me fall and fail because of the testing. When you're, when you're talking about this testing, there's a, there's a couple of, of really helpful places in the Bible um, where Jesus was tested. And we're going to read those this morning. Uh, the first one was Jesus being led into the wilderness in uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Does anybody think that? Do you think about that experience that Jesus had? Led into the wilderness and not eating for 40 days and, and he was hungry. Do you think that that was fun for him? That was a horrible experience. And, and, and if he had a choice based on his comfort levels, He'd be like, yeah, I don't want to do that. He didn't do it because, hey, let's go do that on a Saturday afternoon. That, that wasn't what was going on. He chose to do that. It needed doing. 
But, but it wasn't a comfortable experience, and he had a choice, didn't he? Now, this is Jesus, so he's always going to make the right choice. But it doesn't mean the choice wasn't there. He could have exalted himself and chose to, to rule the whole world in the way that human nature dictates we should rule the whole world. Or he could go down the other path and be obedient to the Father and be the servant of all. He could choose to satisfy his flesh, or he could choose to be obedient to the Father. So the testing opened up to him a choice. And again, Jesus is always going to choose right, but it's still a good example of testing in our lives. When those things, you can take each one of those things that the enemy said to him and in different ways put it in front of your life and say, okay, I've been in a time where I had that choice too. The second test that Jesus went through was in the garden. In Matthew 26, verses 36 through 39, it says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and began, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to him, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus, Jesus is suffering here. Imagine the description here when Jesus says that my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Never let it be said that, that Jesus can't relate with, with our sorrows. Because we've been in places where our heart is so troubled that it consumes our thoughts and our mind. Where we're in struggles and trials. Or even worse, our kids are in struggles and trials. And you can't think about anything else. And I, I think that it's easy for us to say, well, he was Jesus. So he knew everything was going to be okay and nothing really bothered him anyways. But he was right there in a place where he was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. What does that look like in a compassionate God? God was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I, I, I thought I was kind of consumed with the Scripture a little bit yesterday, and I was thinking about it. He was, just, he was right before he died, was going to die. But I don't think it was the act of death and the physical suffering that he was laying hold of in this scripture. If you look around the world, it is full of evil, full of sin, full of human nature. I, I've told this story before, but it always speaks to me. I was coming back from a missions trip with the youth group, and we stopped at this little town to go to, to Red Robin to grab some food. And it was a mill town, and it stank really bad. It was gross. Like, you get off the bus, and it, the wall of stink just hits you. And I walked into the restaurant, and being the caring, compassionate teenager that I was, <laughs> I looked at the waitress that was seating us and goes, I go, how can you stand that smell all the time? You guys probably know what her reply was, right? What smell? <laughs> right, because she can't smell it anymore. That's us with sin. That's us. We're living in this world, and we're going, this isn't too bad. This is all right. 
But you look around and it is stinks with the presence of sin. And so you take a perfect God, Jesus, made flesh, and he was right before the time that he was going to take all of that sin on himself. And I think that it creates this, I'm speculating here, but, but think about what that sin represents is the hurting of people that he loves. Can you, can you imagine Jesus and these multitudes of crowds being able to see in, in each person's life like the time he fed the 5,000, there's thousands of people, and him be able to look at a person's life and see all of the hurt and all of the pain and all of the reasons that they're disconnected from the Father in every single person that he saw. Can you imagine what that would do to a person who sees things clearly in a world that's so horrible like ours? And so here he is about to take the sin of the world on his shoulders. And he was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He was struggling. And he says, my father, if if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. This is... This sounds an awful lot like the end of that prayer he gave us to pray, doesn't it? It sounds an awful lot like, Father, lead me not into the test, but I choose you in your way. In this test, let me serve you. In this test, to the, in this test where I am overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, let me not fail to do your will. I don't think anybody wants to go through testing and trials. I don't think anybody wants to, and that's okay. I would be worried about you if you were running around looking for your next trial. No one wants to find them in a place, selves in a place where their soul is so sorrowful to the point of death. Nobody wants to go through that. We don't want to go through testing, and that's okay. It's okay to pray and ask God to keep us from going through times of testing. It's okay to say, Lord, I don't want to do this. I see this test coming. I don't want to do this. Keep me from tests. But we need to be able to finish that prayer with but not my will be done, but yours. We need to be able to finish that prayer. There's a lot that hangs on that but. There's a lot that hangs on that part of our prayer. If we say, Father, I don't want to go through this testing, and we get stuck at that willfulness and that that stubbornness and get stuck at that point where I don't want to do that, and we get stuck there, then then we find ourselves disconnected from God. But, not my will be done, but yours. Father, I don't like this trial that I'm going through right now. It's hard. It's hard. And you can plug into that sentence whatever it is that you're dealing with right now. I don't want to do this. It's hard. But not my will be done, but yours. We've all experienced what it's like to leave that part of the prayer off. It's kind of like a kite with the cut string, the, the string cut a little bit, isn't it? where you're just flapping in the wind and you don't know what to do next because you don't have an answer for what's going on. And you don't have direction. But, not my will be done, but yours. 
That's the a, a important part of that the prayer. And it's so good because we get to come and recognize that, Lord, I'm going through this testing, but you've got me. Amen? Jen, can you come up and read that Scripture again for me? Isn't God good to give us a, a prophetic word that has to do with everything that He's saying? <laughs> but now, O oh Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O oh Israel, the one who formed you says, Do not be afraid. For I have ransomed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you walk through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through fire of oppression, you will not be burned up, and the flames will not consume you. Amen. Isn't that good? Yes. Thank you, Jen. That's in Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. So... As I, was, as I was chewing on this good food this week, um, there's a picture that, that God gave me about a man standing be, in front of two paths. And there was a choice to be had. He could choose to walk down one path or the other. And the first path was the path of comfort. Um, the path of comfort was the path where he walks down this path and his goal is to have a good life and to be comfortable and be happy in life. You could call it the American dream, right? The, pers the pursuit of happiness. Funny thing about the American dream and the pursuit of happiness is you're always chasing it around, but you never actually get it. You're just pursuing it all the time. But in this, in this picture, he, it, the, it was that his goal was to have a good life, to be comfortable, two cars, two kids and a wife, white picket fence, I want to have a good life. And in this picture, when the man walked down the path, he still went through hardship and testing. But he found himself continually frustrated and beat down because of the hard times and the testing that he was going through because he wasn't achieving his goal. So his goal was to be comfortable, but he always found himself in trials and coming through times in his life where his life didn't meet the standard that he had set for himself. The second path was the path of sonship. The path of sonship. The purpose of this path was to grow closer to the Father as an adopted son. So his stated purpose was, I want to grow closer to my Father. I want to be his beloved son. And as the man went down this path, he had good times, good seasons, and he had hardship and he had testing. But in every season he went through, he accomplished his goal of growing closer to the Father and coming outside the other side of that season closer to his Father, closer to achieving that goal. This man was blessed and learned to have joy no matter what the situation was. It's okay for your prayer to be, God, keep me from testing. But it's, we've got to be careful how much value we put on our life to stay away from testing. Our goal in our life, our, our goal can't be to not be tested. Because we're all going to go through testing. But when you're tested, let it be with a sense of purpose that you're going to grow closer to the Father through the test. There's two types of people in the world. There's a type that go through hardship and testing and come out the other side having gained nothing from it. And there's the type that go through hardship and testing and come out the other side having learned to uh, humility and having learned to surrender their life to the Lord just a little bit more. Jim, can you come up? We're going we're gonna to close. I want to leave you with this. If you are His, and, and what I mean by His is that you are in love with Jesus and that He's your King. If you are His, 
if being His is bigger to you than anything else in your life. If you are His, then in the testing, you will choose Him. In the midst of the testing, you will choose Him. But here's the, here's the hard part, and this is why testing is so important. At the same time, without testing, it's impossible to know if you're actually His. Because when you're, everything's good, and, you, and life is blessed, and everything's good, and nothing's going wrong, and you're living life, and you're like, I am totally Jesus's. I totally surrendered my life and my attitude and my beliefs and my pride to Him. I have no problems with any of those things. It's easy to have the viewpoint that you're His when everything's good. Right? But when you go through testing, and the purpose of testing is, is to bring that stuff to the surface that you didn't really know was buried down there. And you, and you can look at it and go, okay, I am His, and I'm making a choice to be His, but apparently... I need a little work on surrendering my attitude to him a little bit more. Like there's some things maybe I need to work on because I'm discovering in this testing time that, that there's areas of my heart that aren't his. And that's the choice. In your testing, you can choose to be humble and begin to surrender those areas to your life that pop up. Or... You can choose to be prideful and get angry about the things that you're going through. The last few weeks, this has kind of been something that has been something I've been experiencing because there's things that the Lord is teaching me, but there's two types of teaching. The first type is head knowledge. And so the Lord was teaching me this stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's really good, God. I'm going to grab hold of that. And he says, okay. So then he be begins to bring stuff up in my life that's sitting down in there that has to do with what he taught me that are strongholds in my life that I didn't know anything about. And when they start to come to the surface, and, and, you, and when that happens, you guys know what refining fire looks like? They take the ore and they're... They melt it down and they refine it and all the dross, all the stuff comes to the surface of that. It all comes to the surface so that they can scrape all that junk off. So it's easy to have head knowledge, but when the stuff starts coming to the surface, because we're more than just head knowledge. There's heart issues that God's healing us of. And it's funny because when that stuff starts to come to the surface, you're like, what is the matter with me? I thought I was solid. I thought I had my act together. I thought I loved God, but all this stuff, I'm acting crazy this last week. Because <laughs> that stuff coming to the surface actually looks like something. Right? But that has to happen. That's part of the healing, that refining fire, that testing. That's part of the process. And so you're going to act crazy every once in a while because it's not enough for you to just learn in your head who God is and how to serve Him. There's deep healing in your life going on, and that stuff has to bubble up at some point. And I have found God to be so good that it bubbles up at the right point. He waits till you're in a season. Okay, this is the season that we're dealing with these issues. These are the seasons where all the hard relationship stuff that you had with your dad that's been buried for the last 40 years that you thought you'd put away and you're over with, we're going to bring those to the surface and begin to bring healing in those areas. And you're going to act funny for a few weeks or a year. And that's okay. Because God's purpose isn't to have us not act funny. It's to bring us healing. 
Isn't that good? That He's faithful? So when you find yourself with those things bubbling up in your life, if you're surrendered to Him, you're going to have those seasons. Don't be too hard on yourself. We all act funny sometimes. Sometimes, some of us more than others. <laughs> Father, we just love You. We love that You're faithful. Lord, I pray that as those times of testing come into our lives, that You would help us to surrender to the testing, surrender to the, the process. Let those things come up in our lives so that You can bring healing to those areas. I pray that we wouldn't close those things off from You but we would open them up and say, Lord, whatever it is that You're bringing out in me right now, I pray that You'd heal it. Bring healing to my life. And just, Lord, help us to be humble in our times of testing and surrendered to You so that we can surrender to the process of You healing our lives. We thank You for the opportunities to deal with some of those things in our life, even if those opportunities look like hard times. We love You, Father, and we thank You for loving us. Thank You for being here this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen? Amen. I love you guys.